Hi, my name's Abigail and I am the Sensible Senko. I've been asked to record a video for Keeping Children Safe in Education, the Statutory Guidance for Schools and Colleges, September 2019. This video is designed to convey the information in a slightly different way. Cartoons and humour are used to maintain engagement but should not distract from the importance of the information contained. The lady who requested this said she usually falls asleep within three minutes of actually starting to read the guidance. Can't blame her if I'm honest. However, let's try to get it across in a slightly different manner. The status of this guidance then. The Holy Grail. This is statutory guidance from the Department for Education. The department issued under Section 175 of the Education Act 2002, the Education Independent School and Standards Regulations 2014 and the Non-Maintained Special Schools in England Regulations 2015. Schools and colleges in England must have regard to it when carrying out their duties to safeguard and promote the welfare of children. For the purposes of this guidance, children includes everyone under the age of 18. Doesn't include me then. This guidance. We use the terms must and should throughout the guidance. We use the term must when the person in question is legally required to do something and should when the advice set out should be followed unless there's a good reason not to. The guidance should be read alongside the statutory guidance working together to safeguard children and departmental advice what to do if you are worried about a child being abused advice for practitioners. However, it is only a requirement that staff need to read part one of the Keeping Children Safe in Education, which is what is on this video. Unless otherwise specified, school means all schools, whether maintained, non-maintained or independent, including academies, free schools and alternative provision academies, maintained nursery schools and pupil referral units. College means further education colleges and sixth form colleges as established under the Further Higher Education Act 1992 and institutions designated as being within the further education sector. It relates to their responsibilities towards children who are receiving education or training at college. It excludes 16 to 19 academies and free schools which are required to comply with relevant safeguarding legislation by virtue of their funding agreement. There are two footnotes associated with this, one for early years and one around further and higher education. They are detailed on this slide. I promise I'm not actually really lying down. The guidance is statutory and should be read and followed by the governing bodies and maintained schools, including maintained nursery schools and colleges. The proprietors of independent schools, including academies, free schools and alternative provision academies, and non-maintained special schools. In the case of academies, free schools and AP, the proprietor will be the Academy Trust. It should also be followed by the management committees of pupil referral units. The above persons should ensure that all staff, I repeat, all staff, that would include governors, in their college or school read at least part one of the guidance, this video. The above person should also ensure that mechanisms are in place to assist staff to understand and discharge their role and responsibilities as set out in part one of the guidance. This guidance replaces Keeping Children Safe in Education September 2018 and should you wish to read the whole book, a table of substantive changes is included in Annex H. Part 1. Safeguarding information for all staff. The statutory bit that we all have to read. I repeat, we all have to read. What school and college staff should know and do. There should be a child-centred and coordinated approach to safeguarding. Schools and colleges and their staff are an important part of the wider safeguarding system for children. This system is described in statutory guidance, working together to safeguard children. Safeguarding and promoting the welfare of children is everyone's responsibility. 
everyone who comes into contact with children and their families has a role to play. In order to fulfil this responsibility effectively, all practitioners should make sure their approach is child-centred. This means they should consider at all times what is in the best interests of the child. No single practitioner can have a full picture of a child's needs and circumstances. If children and families are to receive the right help at the right time, everyone who comes into contact with them has a role to play in identifying concerns, sharing information and taking prompt action. Safeguarding and promoting the welfare of children is defined for the purposes of this guidance as protecting children from maltreatment, preventing impairment of children's health or development, ensuring that children grow up in circumstances consistent with the provision of safe and effective care, and taking action to enable all children to have the best outcomes. Children includes everyone under the age of 18. The role of school and college staff. School and college staff are particularly important as they are in a position to identify concerns early, provide help for children and prevent concerns from escalating. All staff have a responsibility to provide a safe environment in which children can learn. All staff should be prepared to identify children who may benefit from early help. Early help means providing support as soon as a problem emerges at any point in a child's life, from the foundation years through to the teenage years. Yes, I am reading the slides to you. Close your eyes and just listen. Any staff member who has a concern about a child's welfare should follow the referral processes set out in paragraphs 36 to 47. Staff should expect to support social workers and other agencies following any referral. Every school and college should have a designated safeguarding lead, often abbreviated to DSL, who will provide support to staff to carry out their safeguarding duties and who will liaise closely with other services such as children's social care. The designated safeguarding lead and any deputies are most likely to have a complete safeguarding picture and be the most appropriate person to advise on the response to a safeguarding concern. The Teachers' Standards 2012 state that teachers, which includes head teachers, should safeguard children's well-being and maintain public trust in the teaching profession as a part of their professional duties. Two footnotes were referred to. Detailed information on early help can be found in Chapter 1 of Working Together to Safeguard Children and the teaching standards apply to all trainees working towards QTS, Qualified Teacher Status. All teachers completing their statutory induction period, newly qualified teachers or NQTs, and teachers in maintained schools, including maintained special schools who are subject to the Education School Teachers Appraisal England Regulations 2012. What school and college staff need to know? All staff should be aware of systems within their school or college which support safeguarding and these should be explained to them as part of staff induction. This could include the child protection policy, a behaviour policy, a staff behaviour policy, sometimes called a code of conduct, safeguarding response to children who go missing from education and the role of the designated safeguarding lead, including the identity of the designated safeguarding lead and any deputies. It's usually helpful to actually provide that information on the first day. Copies of policies and a copy of part one of the Keeping Children Safe in Education document should be provided to all staff at induction. They also need to be reminded of it on a yearly basis. Another footnote then. All schools are required to have a behaviour policy. Full details are available. If a college chooses to have a behaviour policy, it should be provided to staff as described in the previous paragraph above. All staff should receive appropriate safeguarding child protection training, which is regularly updated. In addition, 
All staff should receive safeguarding and child protection updates, for example, via an email, e-bulletins or staff meeting, as required, and at least annually, to provide them with the relevant skills and knowledge to safeguard children effectively. This is commonly done in the first inset of each academic year. All staff should be aware of their local early help process and understand their role in it. All staff should be aware of the process for making referrals to children's social care and for statutory assessments under the Children's Act 1989, especially Section 17, Children in Need, and Section 47, A Child Suffering or Likely to Suffer Significant Harm, that may follow a referral, along with the role that they might be expected to play in such assessments. Please do not confuse Children in Need, Section 17, with Pudsey Bear. All staff should know what to do if a child tells them that he or she is being abused or neglected. Staff should know how to manage the requirement to maintain an appropriate level of confidentiality. This means only involving those who need to be involved, such as the designated safeguarding lead or a deputy, and children's social care. Staff should never promise a child that they will not tell anyone about a report of abuse, as this may ultimately not be in the best interests of the child. Footnotes. Detailed information on early help can be found in Chapter 1 of Working Together to Safeguard Children. More information on statutory assessments is included in paragraph 42. Detailed information on statutory assessments can be found in Chapter 1 of Working Together to Safeguard Children. I really do wonder why we don't just give people a copy of Working Together to Safeguard Children. What school and college staff should look out for? Early help. Any child may benefit from early help, but all school and college staff should be particularly alert to the potential need for early help for a child who is disabled and has specific additional needs, has special educational needs, whether or not they have a statutory education, health and care plan, is a young carer is showing signs of being drawn into antisocial or criminal behaviour, including gang involvement and association with organised crime groups, is frequently missing, goes missing from care or from home, is at risk of modern slavery, trafficking or exploitation, is at risk of being radicalised or exploited, is in a family circumstance presenting challenges for the child, such as drug and alcohol misuse, adult mental health issues or domestic abuse? Is misusing drugs or alcohol themselves? Has returned home to their family from care and those who are a privately fostered child? Abuse and neglect. At this point, it would be pertinent to remind you that should any of this um, video be distressing, please stop and talk with your safeguarding lead in school. Knowing what to look for is vital to the early identification of abuse and neglect. All staff should be aware of indicators of abuse and neglect so that they are able to identify cases of children who may be in need of help or protection. If staff are unsure, they should always speak to the designated safeguarding lead or their deputy. All school and college staff should be aware that abuse, neglect and safeguarding issues are rarely standalone events that can be covered by one definition or label. In most cases, multiple issues will overlap with one another. Indicators of abuse and neglect Abuse. A form of maltreatment of a child. Somebody may abuse or neglect a child by inflicting harm or failing to act to prevent harm. Children may be abused in a family or in an institutional or community setting by those known to them or, more rarely, by others. Abuse can take place wholly online or technology may be used to facilitate offline abuse. Children may be abused by an adult or adults or by another child or children. Physical abuse. A form of abuse, even, which may involve hitting, shaking, throwing, poisoning, burning or scalding, drowning, suffocating 
or otherwise causing physical harm to a child. Physical harm may also be caused when a parent or carer fabricates the symptoms of or deliberately induces illness in a child. Emotional abuse. The persistent emotional maltreatment of a child such as to cause severe and adverse effects on the child's emotional development. It may involve conveying to a child that they are worthless or unloved, inadequate or valued only in so far as they meet the needs of another person. It may include not giving the child opportunities to express their views, deliberately silencing them or making fun of what they say or how they communicate. It may feature age or developmentally inappropriate expectations being imposed on children. These may include interactions that are beyond a child's developmental capability, as well as overprotection and limitation of exploration and learning, or preventing the child from participating in normal social interaction. It may involve seeing or hearing the ill treatment of another. It may involve serious bullying, including cyberbullying, causing children frequently to feel frightened or in danger, or the exploitation or corruption of children. Some level of emotional abuse is involved in all types of maltreatment of a child, although it may occur alone. Sexual abuse involves forcing or enticing a child or young person to take part in sexual activities, not necessarily involving a high level of violence, whether or not the child is aware of what is happening. The activities may involve physical contact, including assault by penetration, for example rape or oral sex, or non-penetrative acts such as masturbation, kissing, rubbing and touching outside of clothing. They may also include non-contact activities, such as involving children in looking at or in the production of sexual images, watching sexual activities, encouraging children to behave in sexually inappropriate ways, or grooming a child in preparation for abuse. Sexual abuse can take place online, and technology can be used to facilitate offline abuse. Sexual abuse is not solely perpetrated by adult males. Women can also commit acts of sexual abuse, as can other children. The sexual abuse of children by other children is a specific safeguarding issue in education. See paragraph 27. Neglect. The persistent failure to meet a child's basic physical and or psychological needs, likely to result in the serious impairment of the child's health or development. Neglect may occur during pregnancy, for example, as a result of maternal substance abuse. Once a child is born, neglect may involve a parent or carer failing to provide adequate food, clothing and shelter, including exclusion from the home or abandonment. Protect a child from physical and emotional harm or danger. Ensure adequate supervision, including the use of inadequate caregivers. Or ensure access to appropriate medical care or treatment. It may also include neglect of or unresponsiveness to a child's basic emotional needs. Safeguarding issues. All staff should have an awareness of safeguarding issues that can put a child at risk of harm. Behaviours linked to issues such as drug taking, alcohol abuse, deliberately missing education and sexting, also known as youth produced sexual imagery, I think I'll stick with sexting, put children in danger. Peer on peer abuse. All staff should be aware that children can abuse other children often referred to as peer-on-peer -peer abuse. This is most likely to include, but may not be limited to, bullying, including cyberbullying. Physical abuse, such as hitting, kicking, shaking, biting, hair pulling, or otherwise causing physical harm. Sexual violence, such as rape, assault by penetration, and sexual assault. Sexual harassment, such as sexual comments, remarks, jokes and online sexual harassment, which may be standalone or part of a broader pattern of abuse. Upskirting, 
which typically involves taking a picture under a person's clothing without them knowing, with the intention of viewing their genitals or buttocks to obtain sexual gratification or cause the victim humiliation, distress or alarm. Sexting, also known as the youth-produced sexual imagery, and initiation or hazing-type violence and rituals. All staff should be clear as to the school's or college's policy and procedures with regards to peer-on-peer -peer abuse. This will probably appear in your bullying policy or your behaviour policy. Footnotes. For further information about sexual violence, see Annex A. For further information about sexual harassment, see Annex A. For further information about upskirting, see Annex A. Serious violence. All staff should be aware of indicators which may signal that children are at risk from or are involved with serious violent crime. These may include increased absence from school, a change in friendships or relationships with older individuals or groups, a significant decline in performance, signs of self-harm or a significant change in well-being, or signs of assault or unexplained injuries. Unexplained gifts or new possessions could also indicate that children have been approached by or are involved with individuals associated with criminal networks or gangs. All staff should be aware of the associated risks and understand the measures in place to manage these. Advice for schools and colleges is provided in the Home Officers Preventing Youth Violence and Gang Involvement and its Criminal Exploitation of Children and Vulnerable Adults County Lines Guidance. For more information about violent crime, see Annex A. Female Genital Mutilation, FGM. Whilst all staff should speak to the designated safeguarding lead or deputy with regard to any concerns about female genital mutilation, FGM, there is a specific legal duty on teachers. If a teacher in the course of their work in the profession discovers that an act of FGM appears to have been carried out on a girl under the age of 18, the teacher must report this to the police. See Annex A for further details. Footnote. Under Section 5B 11A of the Female Genital Mutilation Act 2003, teacher means in relation to England, a person with Section 141A 1 of the Education Act 2002, persons employed or engaged to carry out teaching work at schools and other institutions in England. Just read it as, anybody who works in a school who becomes aware of FGM must report it directly to the police as well as your safeguarding lead in school. Please do not rely on just reporting it to your safeguarding lead in school. Your legal requirement is to report it directly to the police. Contextual safeguarding. Safeguarding incidents and or behaviours can be associated with factors outside the school or college and or can occur between children outside the school or college. All staff, but especially the designated safeguarding lead and deputies, should be considering the context within which such incidents and or behaviours occur. This is known as contextual safeguarding which simply means assessments of children should consider whether wider environmental factors are present in a child's life that are a threat to their safety and or welfare. Children's social care assessments should consider such factors, so it is important that schools and colleges provide as much information as possible as part of a referral process. This will allow any assessment to consider all the available evidence and the full context of any abuse. Additional information regarding contextual safeguarding is available in the document Contextual Safeguarding. Additional information and support. The departmental advice, what to do if you are worried about a child being abused, advice for practitioners, provides more information on understanding and identifying abuse and neglect. Examples of potential indicators of abuse and neglect are highlighted throughout the advice and would be particularly helpful for school and college staff. The NSPCC website also provides 
useful additional information on abuse and neglect and what to look out for. Annex A contains important additional information about specific forms of abuse and safeguarding issues. School and college leaders and those staff who work directly with children should read the Annex. I have not included the Annex in this video, but it is recommended that you have a copy to hand should you need it. What school and college staff should do if they have concerns about a child. Staff working with children are advised to maintain an attitude of it could happen here where safeguarding is concerned. When concerned about the welfare of a child, staff should always act in the best interests of the child. If staff have any concern about a child's welfare, they should act on them immediately. There is a flowchart towards the end setting out the process for staff when they have concerns about a child. If staff have a concern, they should follow their own organisation's child protection policy and speak to the designated safeguarding lead or their deputy. Options will then include managing any support for the child internally via the school's or college's own pastoral support processes or an early help assessment or a referral for statutory services. For example, the child might be in need or is in need of or suffering or likely to suffer from harm. Some more footnotes. Further information on early help assessments, provision of early help services and accessing services is in chapter one of Working Together to Safeguard Children. Chapter one of Working Together to Safeguard Children sets out that the safeguarding partners should publish a threshold document that should include the criteria, including the level of need, for when a case should be referred to a local authority children's social care for assessment and for statutory services under section 17 and 47. Local authorities with their partners should develop and publish local protocols for assessment. A local protocol should set out clear arrangements for how cases will be managed once a child is referred into local authority children's social care. Very often when you refer a case to your DSL, they will talk about it having to meet threshold and the thresholds tend to be very tight and quite high. The designated safeguarding lead or a deputy should always be available to discuss safeguarding concerns. If in exceptional circumstances the designated safeguarding lead or deputy is not available, this should not delay appropriate action being taken. Staff should consider speaking to a member of the senior leadership team and or take advice from a local children's social care. In these circumstances, any action taken should be shared with the designated safeguarding lead or deputy as soon as it is practically possible. Staff should not assume that a colleague or other professional will take action and share the information that may be critical in keeping children safe. They should be mindful that early information sharing is vital for effective identification, assessment and allocation of appropriate service provision. Information sharing, advice for practitioners providing safeguarding services to children, young people, parents and carers, supports staff who have had to make decisions about sharing information. The advice includes the seven golden rules for sharing information and considerations with regard to the Data Protection Act 2018 and the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. If any doubt about sharing information, staff should speak to their designated safeguarding lead or a deputy. Fears about sharing information must not be allowed to stand in the way of the need to promote the welfare and protect the safety of children. If early help is appropriate, the designated safeguarding lead or deputy will generally lead on liaising with other agencies and setting up an inter-agency assessment as appropriate. Staff may be required to support other agencies and professionals in an early help assessment, in some cases acting as a lead protect practitioner. Any such cases should be kept under constant review and consideration given to a referral to the Children's Social Care for Assessment for Statutory Services if the child's situation does not appear to be improving 
or is getting worse. Statutory assessments. Where a child is suffering or is likely to suffer from harm, it is important that a referral to the children's social care and, if appropriate, the police is made immediately. Referrers should follow the local referral process. This will be stated in your child protection policy within school. Children in need. A child in need is defined under the Children's Act 1989 as a child who is unlikely to achieve or maintain a reasonable level of health or development or whose health and development is likely to be significantly or further impaired without the provision of services or a child who is disabled. That's where Pudsey Bear comes in. Local authorities are required to provide services for children in need for the purposes of safeguarding and promoting their welfare. Children in need may need to be assessed under Section 17 of the Children's Act 1989. Children suffering or likely to suffer significant harm. Local authorities, with the help of other organisations as appropriate, have a duty to make enquiries under Section 47 of the Children's Act 1989 if they have reasonable cause to suspect that the child is suffering or is likely to suffer from significant harm. Such enquiries enable them to decide whether they should take any action to safeguard and promote the child's welfare and must be initiated where there are concerns about maltreatment, including all forms of abuse and neglect, female genital mutilation or other so-called honour-based violence and extra-familial threats like radicalisation and sexual exploitation. The online tool report. The online tool Report Child Abuse to Your Local Council directs to the relevant local children's social care contact number. What will the local authority do? <laughs> Sorry, that didn't really mean to come out. Uh, within one day of a referral being made, a local authority social worker should acknowledge receipt to the referrer and make a decision about the next steps and the type of response that is required. This will include determining whether the child needs immediate protection and urgent action is required. The child is in need and should be assessed under Section 17 of the Children's Act 1989. There is reasonable cause to suspect the child is suffering or likely to suffer significant harm and whether inquiries must be made and the child assessed under Section 47 of the Children's Act 1989. Any services are required by the child and family and what type of services. Further specialist assessments are required to help the local authority to decide what further action to take and to see the child as soon as possible if the decision is taken that the referrer needs a further assessment. The referrer should follow up if this information is not forthcoming. <laughs> if social workers decide to carry out a statutory assessment, staff should do everything they can to support that assessment, supported by the designated safeguarding lead or deputy as required. If, after a referral, the child's situation does not appear to be re improving, the referrer should consider following local escalation procedures to ensure their concerns have been addressed and, most importantly, that the child's situation improves. Record keeping. All concerns, discussions and decisions made and the reasons for those decisions should be recorded in writing. If in doubt about recording requirements, staff should discuss with their designated safeguarding lead or their deputy. This will vary school to school according to the different processes that are in place. Why is all of this important? It is important for children to receive the right help at the right time to address risks and prevent issues escalating. Research and serious case reviews have repeatedly shown the dangers of failing to take effective action. Examples of poor practice include failing to act on and refer the early signs of abuse and neglect. Poor record 
housekeeping. Oh, I'd love to tell you the story about the school that shredded everything. Sorry, failing to listen to the views of the child. Failing to reassess concerns where situations did not improve. Not sharing information. Sharing information too slowly. And a lack of challenge to those who appear not to be taking action. An analysis of serious case reviews can be found on the NSPCC website. It's actually a really interesting document. What school and college staff should do if they have concerns about another staff member who may pose a risk of harm to children? Oh dear. If staff have safeguarding concerns or an allegation is made about another member of staff, including volunteers, posing a risk of harm to children, then this should be referred to the head teacher or principal. You bypass your DSL in this instance. Where there are concerns or allegations about the head teacher or principal, this should be referred to the chair of governors, chair of the management committee, or proprietor of an independent school. This, again, bypasses the DSL. In the event of concerns or allegations about the head teacher, where the head teacher is also the sole proprietor of an independent school, allegations should be reported directly to the designated officer at the local authority sometimes referred to as the LADO, Local Authority Designated Officer. Further details can be found in Part 4 of the Keeping Children Safe in Education Guidance. What school or college staff should do if they have concerns about safeguarding practices within their school or college? All staff and volunteers should feel able to raise concerns about poor or unsafe practice and potential failures in the school or college's safeguarding regime and know that such concerns will be taken seriously by the senior leadership team. Appropriate whistleblowing procedures should be put in place for such concerns to be raised with the school or college's senior leadership team or those that actually supervise the senior leadership team. Where a staff member feels unable to raise an issue with their employer or feels that their genuine concerns are not being addressed, other whistleblowing channels may be open to them, but please expire all other sources first. General guidance on whistleblowing can be found via Advice on Whistleblowing and the NSPCC's What You Can Do to Report Abuse Dedicated Helpline is available as an alternative route for staff who do not feel able to raise concerns regarding child protection failures internally or have concerns about the way a concern is being handled by their school or college. Staff can call 0800 028 0285, available from 8am to 8pm Monday to Friday or email help at nspcc.org.uk. Alternatively, if you prefer to use snail mail, you can send a letter to National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, NSPCC, Western House, 42 Curtain Road, London, EC2A3NH. Actions where there are concerns about a child. That flowchart comes with a number of footnotes. In cases which also involve concern or allegation of abuse against a staff member, you should consider part four of the Keeping Children Safe in Education guidance. Early help means providing support as soon as a problem emerges at any point in a child's life, where a child would benefit from working with coordinated early help, an early help interagency assessment should be arranged. Chapter 1 of Working Together to Safeguard Children provides detailed guidance on the early help process. Referrals should follow the process set out in the local threshold document and local protocol for assessment. Again, Chapter 1 of Working Together to Safeguard Children. Under the Children's Act 1989, local authorities are required to provide services for children in need for the purposes of safeguarding and promoting their welfare. Children in need may be assessed under Section 17 of the Children's Act 1989, under Section 47 of the Children's Act 1989, where the local authority has reasonable cause to suspect that the child is suffering, 
or likely to suffer significant harm, it has a duty to make inquiries to decide whether to take action to safeguard or promote the child's welfare. Full details are found in, guess where? Chapter 1 of Working Together to Safeguard Children. You may have to apply for an emergency protection order if a child needs to be taken urgently into care. That is the end of part one of Keeping Children Safe in Education, September 2019. I hope you didn't fall asleep listening to it. and I hope you didn't mind me reading from the slides on the screen. But you have now fulfilled your statutory obligation to read that part one. Thank you.